Yeah, I thought maybe I was like, oh, he's not gonna drink the poison. It's gonna be like a um a Quentin Tarantino ending where everything's different. No, no, they both died. Mm -mm. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I put on my clown wig and clown nose and I was like, what did you expect? It, it was Romeo and Juliet <laughs> through and through, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Art of Costing Blackcast. I'm Elizabeth Joy Glass. And thy name is Spencer Williams. <laughs> Hi, Spencer. <laughs> Hello. I've been practicing my Shakespearean and it's not working. You, you've been practicing your old Shakespearean English. <laughs> yeah, it's Just, real fun. you know, really getting into Shakespeare month, right? I've said this before. I wish we still spoke in like that old English dialect it'd be fun this movie that we're about to talk about really like reinforced that for me <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe were you uh, ever was... in a, like a shakespeare play i actually don't think i ever was the one year the year my high school did a shakespeare play i either didn't get in it or i wasn't old enough hmm but I remember helping with the costumes for it. Oh, well. They did a Midsummer Night's Dream. There you I go, I think I was in eighth grade, and I think it was a high school production. Oh. I remember in drama class doing, I think it was either, I thought, maybe Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet. For sure, okay. Romeo and Juliet. I think I was Tybalt. Tibble, you were. T I think so. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> but I'm not ready to bet money on it. But it was just like in a classroom, and for some reason, it took us like several weeks to get through the entire thing. Oh, um, interesting. I don't really remember how long it is, but I'm guessing the book is pretty long. I mean, it's a play, or so it's not play, yeah. too terribly long. Yeah, but imagine a bunch of, like, sixth graders trying to read Romeo and Juliet. Oh, my gosh. No, thank you. Uh-uh. Okay. All that made sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually love Shakespeare. Like, I love Shakespeare. I took my freshman year of high school, I took a Shakespeare class which I was really annoyed my senior year. I found out it didn't count towards my extra credits <laughs> to graduate. But I was very annoyed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I love it. What I don't love, Spencer. Uh oh, here it comes. Is what we watched this week. <laughs> what did we watch? This week, we watched the 1996 adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, directed by the Baz Luhrmann. <laughs> Elizabeth, I once we put this, put this on the calendar, I remembered, I was like, oh, Elizabeth actually hates just all Romeo and Juliet stories, not specifically this mm -hmm. one. So as I was watching it the other night, I was like, oh, Elizabeth's going to be so mad. <laughs> <laughs> like I went I really wanted to like this. I just don't like Romeo and Juliet. Right. Like I think like it's ridiculous. The fact that it's still held up as like a, a like love story is ridiculous. <laughs> I think it's far more a cautionary tale for <laughs> Elizabethan Renaissance children to be like listen to your parents and don't hate other people. When did we last but, talk about this? Was it Clueless? Was it Emma? It was, um, it was West Side Story. Oh, West that's Side another Story. That's another Romeo Juliet right. yeah, adaptation. It was, it was definitely West Side Story. It's coming back to me now. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually think I would have liked this movie if they didn't keep the original dialogue. If they had updated the dialogue, I think I would have actually really liked this movie. I actually loved the dialogue. I, that was one of my really? favorite parts of it. Yeah, because it was fun to like, I had to turn on the subtitles, obviously. But to kind of read it, it kind of took me back seeing it against this like modern landscape. I don't know. I was here for it. I'm not saying I... that I love this movie, but I also didn't not like it. I know people love this movie. We've both never seen it. Yeah. So this is why I'm it's excited to time. do this episode. Yeah. But <laughs> um, yeah. Like I, I think if they changed it, I think I would have really liked it. It's just like it's a chaotic movie. They turn Romeo and Juliet into a very chaotic story, which I appreciated because, like, yes, it takes it takes place over what like seventy two hours. It is a chaotic story. Yeah. And then they made it even more chaotic. 
And then like having just like the Shakespearean dialogue in there, I was like, this is too much. <laughs> it was too much. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I think I was just a little put off by Claire Danes being like 17 at this point. And Leonardo was 21, I believe. A little on a creepy side. Oh. Um, so this is from 1996. So it's not that long ago. So interesting. I thought that was a little interesting. However, we are not here to just talk about Romeo and Juliet. No. You know, we have our qualms with William Shakespeare, but he's not around at the moment for us to bring it up. We're here to talk about the <laughs> costumes designed by the brilliant Kim Barrett, who I love so dearly. I think she's a genius. So Yes. And uh, before we get too spoilery, although if Romeo and Juliet is being spoiled for you, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Spencer, why don't you give us a little summary? Sure. In Baz Luhrmann's adaptation of the classic Shakespearean romantic tale <laughs> takes place in a postmodern city named Verona Beach. In this version, the Capulets and the Montagues are two rival gangs. When two star-crossed lovers of the two enemy gangs meet, forbidden love ensues and tragedy follows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Let's go behind the wardrobe now. As we said, we have director Baz Luhrmann and we have costume designer Kim Barrett. Yeah. So we always talk. I always thought this was a Catherine Martin film, but she's actually the production designer on this one, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. She is, which and I mean, hats off to her production design. This like visually, this movie was so stunning. Yeah. Like incredible off like so good like mm -hmm. that's why i wanted to really like this movie but the dialogue just like threw me off too much i think your beef is like we've said before with william shakespeare not baz Luhrmann. <laughs> my beef is not with baz Luhrmann at all it is definitely with william shakespeare <laughs> but you will know kim's work from the matrix movies for which she received costume designer guild domination from hell which we should do at some point. I had to watch that for one of my costume design classes. It's interesting. Mm, I don't even know what that is. It's like it's about like Jack the Ripper. Oh, okay. And it has Johnny Depp in it. It's very interesting. Oh. Uh, Monster in Law, our favorite movie, <laughs> Aragon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the costumes for Aragon are the only redeeming quality about that movie. So props to Kim Barrett. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and she got a costume designer girl domination. So she she did her job. That is wild. I did not actually know that. So that's pretty wild. Uh, the Amazing Spider-Man Speed Racer, which is one of my favorite films ever. Okay. Cloud Atlas costume designer guild domination. Aquaman, another costume designer guild nomination. Us. Yes. Sang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, another costume design nomination. So if you don't know her work, I don't know what movies you've been watching. Seriously, the wrong ones. The wrong ones. And this was pretty much her first job. And she said to Vogue, it was definitely the job you want to be your your first job. It was unforgettable. And yeah, the fact that like what, 25 plus years later, people are still talking about it. Like you did a good job. Right. I knew a lot of these costumes before seeing it. I've never seen this movie before, yeah. but I was pretty familiar with a majority of the costumes. Same. And it sounds like the production went pretty smoothly as she described to Vogue. Catherine, Baz and I all went to... NIDA, the National Institute of Dramatic Arts in Sydney. So we already had a common ground. First, we made a short film with actors from Sydney in an abandoned lot. We dressed up our friends and shot the Marcuccio death scene. Then Baz sent it to Leonardo and to Fox, and they decided to give us a small amount of money to start building up to the project that we wanted to do. We were kind of left on our own. It just grew from there. Catherine, Baz, Craig, and I went to Miami to do research, and Sony gave Baz one of the very first small movie cameras. Mm. So we made little video vignettes, and we edited it into what I guess you would call teasers. 
it was really a learning curve for all of us, but we just took our chances. We were only given 15 million, which is not much money for a movie. We prepared in Canada for a little while, and then we decided to shoot in Mexico City for most of it. So it was a cultural shock as well, but also an incredible adventure. Wow, it was all over the place. Yeah, I'm like, (laughs) wow, this took some time to get like into production, which I kind of can't blame them since they did decide to uh, stick with the Shakespearean dialogue. I'm like, this probably did take some convincing, yeah, you know, studios to be like, yeah, give us your money. It definitely was not an easy project. Um, I think Leonardo DiCaprio, this is before Titanic even. I mean, like, mm-hmm. it might have been shot around the same time, but this came out right before Titanic. So yeah. it's all pretty early on for everyone at this point. Yeah. I mean, he already had made a name for himself because I think he started it in TV. Mm-hmm. So he was already like known, but it, he wasn't like the big star he was about to become with Titanic. Right. And Kim Barrett talked a little about bit to Nylon about, you know, keeping the dialogue the way it is. She said, we really dis dissected what Shakespeare was trying to say and how we wanted the imagery to support those words and tell a visual story so that the audience had time to digest the Shakespearean language and not to be locked out of it. We wanted them to straight away be drawn into this version of Romeo and Juliet in our time with these young characters that people could identify with, even if they're diverse religious culture. I think one of the strengths of the movie is that our characters were very clearly drawn and strong and in the style of movie we were trying to make that was appropriate mm. they did they they did a good job with that right i mean e- even though i don't like it they did do a good job with that <laughs> i do love how they said that they were just kind of really dissecting what shakespeare is trying to say and really try to make their own interpretation of it which Mm -hmm. is why i think i enjoyed it so much because yeah it's a romeo and juliet story you know we don't really love a romeo and juliet story however Mm -hmm. i thought it was still like so beautiful and artistic and i feel like i enjoyed it a little more because it was so chaotic i think that the story is chaotic so it made more sense to me yeah absolutely and let's just take a little breaky break before we dive into this (laughs) yes excited that we got a ball in this we love a costume ball you we all do. know that so we i was so excited <laughs> as soon as this got started I was playing young hearts run free one of my favorite songs i was in it i've already i was like i know i'm gonna like this movie a lot it was wild it was all over the place this is when i kind of felt like i was like i feel a little high or drunk right now watching this it's so <laughs> artsy and all over and so (laughs) colorful and fun it it was wild it was an experience it was so wild it took me a second to realize that romeo was high i was like wait what right so when romeo was high too i was like what is going on (laughs) like what is happening and Kim talked to Priestbeck about the ballroom scene. She said the ballroom was set as a way of contrasting the simplicity of Romeo and Juliet and their love to harness of the world that surrounds them, a world that is more concerned with appearances. It also makes it very clear that there is a reason they are together. They are both outsiders in the extraordinary over the top place that makes sense when you put it in that sense i mean i get it that's why they end up together i don't think i was ready for the jump scare that was seeing 1996 paul rudd in an astronaut suit (laughs) yeah (laughs) how about the jump scare of just seeing paul rudd in this to begin with (laughs) (laughs) and he looks exactly the same i was like is that (laughs) ant-man like okay i was so confused because it starts and there there's this really cool opening with like a newscaster kind of like setting the scene and i was like oh okay cool 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 
And then they have another one. <laughs> right. <laughs> where like they are like, this is this person, this is this person, but it's exactly the same. Like it's a different voiceover, but with the exact same like words. And I'm like, I was just like, wait, hold on. What's happening? And then Paul Rudd's in my face. And I was like, wait, hold on. <laughs> yeah, that was wild. <laughs> Paul Rudd, he is a vampire. We've talked about this before. He, is. he looks the same. Nothing's changed. Um, like, very creepy in a good way. I mean, we, we love Paul Rudd over here, but he looks exactly yeah. the same. And like, I feel like I don't think of him existing before the year 2000. So every time I see him like before that, I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, she talked more about the ball scene to Vogue, uh, in terms of the imagery. She said, I didn't want to bang people over the head with didactic imagery, but I did want there to be a subconscious connection to stories and myths. The ballroom party is populated with characters from Shakespeare. Lord Capulet is a Roman emperor and Lady Capulet is Cleopatra. Then Paul Rudd is Paris as Paris is a bit on the outside, a bit of a space cadet. So an astronaut felt right. <laughs> I always thought of him as floating out a bit beyond reality. Yeah, that makes sense, too. <laughs> yeah. Like, the whole time you're like, why is this guy here? And that makes yeah. sense. He's just I, out there. He's just there. I always kind of feel bad for Paris. Yeah. Because Paris is just, like, a good guy who's just trying to make a good match for himself yeah. in, like, a medieval world. And she's just like, fuck you, Paris. I'm going to go marry this other guy. Right, there and actually just... is nothing wrong with Paris that I can remember. <laughs> and he doesn't know what's happening. It's just one second he knows he's getting married to this nice chick. And then the second, <laughs> another second, she's dead. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's a wild 72 hours. Um, I love Mercutio's costume. That was yes. fabulous. The dance number. I was so in it. No one told me there was a dance number in this movie. No, I was shocked. Like, I see him. I was like, oh, okay. This is about to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> that was so good. So good. Also, what was good are Romeo and Juliet's costumes. Like, yeah. the, like, these are the looks, you know, even if you have not seen this movie. Like, I've seen so many people dress, like, so many couples have done this for Halloween. <laughs> right. Like, we all know what this is. These costumes are burned into my memory because they are really spectacular. I think they're fabulous costumes. I think mm -hmm. they're two of my favorite costumes probably from an entire movie. They're just so iconic. They really are. And Kim put a lot of thought into them as she told Nylon, on Juliet's dress, which I don't think you can see, I printed written lines from the script in white. Romeo wow. says in the script, oh, speak again, bright angel, which is why I dressed her as an angel. But I also printed that dialogue from that scene onto her dress with white print. I tried to do things for the actors that only they could see or have as their own thing. I thought that it would be an important kind of touchstone for them to have. Things like pieces of jewelry and writing engraved on their guns and in the Capulet's case, it's scriptures. So wow, she that's like fascinating. added little things, which I'm like, no, you can't see it. No, you would have no idea. I still don't no. see it. But that's so beautiful, though. And it makes all sense why she's dressed like an angel now. I mean, mm -hmm. ugh, that's so gorgeous. It's so cool. And she also talked about Romeo's costume to Vogue saying, with Leonardo, he's like Lancelot. He's driven away from his own people, from everything he holds dear to him. It's an echo of the knight in shining armor. Only in this case, it doesn't work out, of course. <laughs> I wanted to have that duality of it being one of the greatest romances in the world, but also one of the most tragic. It's like, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. I suspected with the knight armor. I thought it was pretty ironic. Um, cause he is like the knight in shining armor, except he loses in the Not end. Not so much. Not so much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love the armor though. I love how it's, you know, it's armor, but it's not like a full like chest plate. I love how it's like yeah. really heavy on the shoulders and the arms. I think that's so cool. Yeah. It's so, it's costumey. Like it looks like legit, but it's like, oh yeah, this is like a Halloween costume. Like right. it's not trying to do, protect you or do anything crazy. Yeah. 
Um, and their wedding outfits weren't trying to do anything crazy either because the next day <laughs> they get hitched. Um, <laughs> the next day. <laughs> I like their uh, wedding costumes because that Same. felt like to me like the most real part of it. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't. I mean, obviously, they're living in this wild fantasy. But in that moment, that was very real to them. Mm -hmm. So she's wearing like a very simple white I mean, I wouldn't even really call it a wedding dress. It's just like a white, sophisticated dress. Yeah. And Romeo's just suited up looking nice and put together. Like they're going to a courthouse wedding. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's kind of what Kim was going for. She told Nylon, she said, they didn't have a lot of time to get ready for a secret wedding. So I thought it should be very simple little white dress. I didn't want the wedding to be about the costumes. The wedding had to be just about them. Nailed it. Boom. Nailed it. <laughs> and with the help of Prada, she really nailed Romeo's look. She told Nylon again, Miss Prada was really kind enough to make us a suit for Leonardo for the wedding. Wow. Being Australian, we weren't really in the fashion world yet. But everywhere we went, people helped us. So it was pretty cool moment in time. Well, that really worked out. Yeah. And we're going to talk about more a little later about all the help they got from the fashion industry. But one very important part of this movie that we don't really get to see very well is the ring Juliet oh gives to Romeo as she it's told. It's so cute. It's so it says, cute. I love thee. thee. <laughs> <laughs> and she talked to Nylon about this. She said the overall design process was very integrated. But the wedding bands that Romeo and Juliet wore were designed by Martin. I was aiming to complete and integrate with Catherine's production design to create a seamless osmosis of style. The ring was an important thing. There was a lot of discussion about what the ring looked like and what we wrote in the ring. We all got a keepsake at the end, which I think was a really great and lovely thing to have. Oh. So that was the production gift was a replica of the ring. <laughs> Oh, so jealous. I want one. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Apparently, so it's cool. like you can actually like people on Etsy and stuff will like reproduce this ring. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there's so many like, you know, inexpensive copies out there now yeah. at this point. Yeah. I, <laughs> I like... love this cool idea of Catherine Martin doing the production. I yeah. just could imagine. She's just a genius. I'm so excited to talk about her more later on. Um but yeah, I love the collaboration between Kim, Catherine, Baz. It felt like very collaborative. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it was also collaborative with some fashion houses for the background characters, as she described to Vogue. She said, we made almost everything ourselves. The collaborations with the fashion houses were partly because we were strapped for cash. I had done a bunch of photo shoots in New York and met different people at different showrooms. And when I was thinking about how to design for the Capulets, I was like, well, Dolce & Gabbana is a great jumping off point. <laughs> so we struck a deal with them for them to give us old stock that we could use to populate Verona Beach with all the gangs and the background people. They nice. Came <laughs> they came from the showroom with these big boxes of stuff. So the extras fittings were amazingly fun. Everybody loved it. We were able to bastardize some things. We chopped the sleeves off or we over dyed them to age them or threw dirt on them. We were really lucky. And I had an amazing team in Mexico. My cutters and some seamstresses from Montreal and hair and makeup came from Italy. It was wow. really an international crew. We had people from all over the world speaking different languages. That's such a rich way to work on a creative project, you know. There was this really energetic tension. Wow. <laughs> like, talk about something coming together. Right. Everyone and their mother had a piece in this film. I'm surprised yeah. it didn't reach out to us when we were <laughs> one and two years old. Two, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> truly, truly. Um, no, because like all of the actual, all the extras really do have like this distinctive look. Like it's extremely distinctive. And it's like, oh, no wonder it's so cohesive because they just were able to get, you know, all this Dolce and Gabbana and like 
throw it on them and like make it work. Yeah, it is all very cohesive. I didn't really notice that the first time around, but going through it again, it's very cohesive. I always love the color palettes. I think it just came together so awesome. It you know reminds me of Miami or Ms. Brazil, yeah. Mexico City, like we talked about. It's very fun. Um, one of, I think, one of my favorite parts of the film was just seeing all the background actors. Yeah. I also love the distinction between the Capulets and the Montagues, which Kim talked to Vogue about, saying the Capulets definitely have that kind of gunslinging, gangster, low hip, cowboy boots kind of vibe. <laughs> and then the Montagues are more flyboy. They're like guys in Hawaii on leave from the ship. <laughs> yeah. They're still fighters, but they're more laid back and relaxed and American in a way. Which is like absolutely true. Yeah. I was kind of pulled out of it a little bit when I saw Jamie Kennedy with the pink hair. I was like, what is going on? This is wild. <laughs> Wait, that's Jamie Kennedy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't realize that? <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah, I couldn't stop looking at it. <laughs> I do love the pink hair, though. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but Kim is right on, too. I mean, obviously, she designed the costumes, but, like, it is very laid back, kind of Hawaiian. And then that's why whenever they see the Capulets, they look very sophisticated and like a real gang. Yeah. So it seems like the Montagues are always a little bit scared or nervous <laughs> around the Capulets. Yeah. By the way, they dress, they probably should be, honestly. Yeah, honestly, yeah. And Kim added like a lot of symbology into the costumes uh, as she explained to Bo Vogue, saying both families are super religious. So it made sense that when I designed the shirts, they should have that kind of iconography painted on in them. We had an amazing team of fabric painters in our department, and we designed the shirts to have all these different religious symbols embedded in them. Leo's shirt at the end that he wears in the cathedral was definitely the inspiration and jumping off point. I found it in a thrift store in Miami. It already had this very dreamy romantic technicolor motif. Then there's one with the bleeding heart and the death lilies that the team painted. I chose the flowers as foreshadowing of what's going to happen, mm, 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 which it's like, mm, you mm. don't see it at first, but there's like on the Montes, there's lots of like, you know, like the Virgin Mary and like different like iconography on it. And then in the Capulets, it's not like as, you know, noticeable, but they all have like their crosses, their guns have all sorts of iconography on them. It's really interesting. All the little details. Yeah, I definitely feel like I love the Capulet style a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Not saying I'm picking sides here, but perhaps I mean, they I dress am. in almost all black. That's... <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, but <laughs> Elizabeth's <laughs> right. Um, and then, of course, we have Marcuccio, which is probably the, like, classiest looking. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Montague, but he's he's like a friend of the Montagues. And she explained his look a little bit to Nylon, saying, Harold is, of, is of course, a beautiful person, as well as a great actor. And I wanted you to see how vulnerable he was. So I used sheer fabric a lot of the time with him. It was like a veil. We could relate to him, and he didn't wear any armor. And that's why, in the end, he was one of the strongest and most heroic characters in the show. Because he let his true self out. He was different and he embodied the better traits of both those groups. But he was unfortunately sacrificed. Oh, poor Mercutio. Yeah, oh. Um, yeah, I love the use of the sheer fabrics. I mean, Mercutio doesn't really wear a lot of clothes in this film. He no, is he always doesn't. very, <laughs> very vulnerable, very open, um, which I think is why his death is the saddest. Yeah. Um, which is really what his death kind of makes things fall apart. I didn't really understand. I mean, I need to go back and kind of read the play again, but I didn't mm -hmm. understand why he was killed <laughs> at the moment. It was and just was... kind of like a beach blowout at the moment. I yeah. guess a rumble, you would say, but it was pretty sad. And he's sad. also like a curse on both your houses. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure you joined in this. Of right. Your own free Suddenly will, he, but picked, okay. he picked no side in the end. A curse upon both <laughs> of the houses. houses. 
<laughs> that was great. And then the storm rolls in and it's like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, oh, it's time to leave town. Um, I think I loved that part. It was so good. That was that was great. Um, what was also great is when Claire Danes goes to the priest to be like, yo, what am I going to do? I can't marry this guy. Oh my gosh, her little outfit is so cool. I love it. It's giving me it's real nerd moment here. She reminds me of Jill Valentine from Resident Evil. She has a yeah. beret, the gloves, the gun. She looks like even like a Street Fighter character yeah. all of a sudden. And I love this costume so much. But it's like a it's like a uniform. Yeah. And Kim talked to Nylon about it saying it was very simple and classic, but had a little bit of a renegade. She was a cloistered girl, very protected, and from a rich family. I went to an all-girls Church of England Anglican school, and our uniform hadn't changed for 50 or 60 years. So I wanted the uniform to feel a bit like that. She was a very traditional girl in the middle of Miami of a parallel universe, which is two very different worlds. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you definitely get that, like... Catholic school girl almost look. Yeah. <laughs> with this. <laughs> I totally think it's Catholic school girl, but when I see the gloves, that's what makes it like Street Fighter Resident Evil mm -hmm. for me. <laughs> yeah. And it's like just a great little moment because like you really don't see Juliet outside of like some sort of white dress. Right. And then Paris shows up, Mr. Paul Rudd, and he's kind of like, girl, are you okay? What, <laughs> what's happening? I haven't. <laughs> he's like, I'm sorry your cousin died, but like, is everything cool? Right. And she's like, nope, but I don't want to talk to you about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> he's like, all right, see you tomorrow. Uh, but we come to the end with uh, Romeo and Juliet, just lots of miscommunication. <laughs> like yeah. talk about miscommunication ruining the show i mean to me it seems like the postal delivery service was kind of lacking in this parallel universe yeah. because clearly romeo didn't get the letter i think no, the plan like, was basically solid but i think maybe it would have been worth like hand delivering this message and telling juliet like maybe let's wait like a day yeah. or two and i'm like <laughs> hey how about like the guy that was clearly his best man at the wedding who clearly knows what's going on. Why don't you just give it to him and have him ride out to <laughs> Romeo and deliver? Like clearly that kid would have been like, Oh yeah, I'll go tell him about this secret plan. So the two of them can be together. He was at the wedding. Right. Like I Mr. Mean, Priest, sir, what were you doing? Maybe we shouldn't trust priest for like, undercover secret missions maybe the priest maybe. should just be priests and nurses just be nurses yeah <laughs> by the way i loved the nurse i thought she was fantastic she was amazing um, oh my gosh i'm forgetting her name she's in harry potter also she is oh my gosh uh miriam margolis yeah miriam yeah um yeah fantastic but she back to romeo and julia i mean their final looks were pretty beautiful. I love Juliet's look with the white veil. Yeah. It looks comfortable. She doesn't really know she's getting ready to take eternal slumber. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. And I really think this was supposed to be her wedding dress to Paris. I right. think that's like what it was supposed to be. Because it's like, it's white. It's like long sleeve, like mm -hmm. beautiful gown. And then he's got this great like blue blue pants with like this it's not quite a hawaiian shirt but this great blue like pink and red pattern across it it's hawaiian passing though yeah it's definitely like <laughs> a cousin of aloha shirt yeah it's, it's in that it's in that area and what both of these things do is make them look very young which is something kim talked to nylon about she said they're so young and so beautiful a lot of the time I really wanted their faces and their youthfulness to be in front of the canvas. It was all about what was going on in their faces and their eyes because those characters are are who most people identify with. Young, old, everybody's had one of those super intense love affairs. And it's like, oh. I feel like that's what these final looks accomplished. It's like, oh, yeah, they're just kind of yeah. kids. 
I will say I was still shocked at the end when they both died, even though I read this <laughs> seen so, movies. You know, I was like, oh no. This is one of the places I low key like zoned out a little bit. So like I see him, I see him like get up with like the vial of poison, but I didn't see him drink it. And then I saw her hand come up and I was like, oh wait, are they like not gonna die at the end of this? I know. <laughs> like me for too. a second, I was like, oh, everything's gonna be okay. And then I was like, oh, maybe she's not gonna die because clearly they there's all these people outside. One of them is gonna like come in because they're probably all super confused. <laughs> right. <laughs> Everyone's confused. <laughs> but no. No. Same yeah, old, I same thought old. maybe I was like, oh, he's not going to drink the poison. It's going to be like a um a Quentin Tarantino ending where everything's different. No, they both died. I no. was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I put on my clown wig and clown <laughs> nose and I was like, what did you expect? <laughs> it, it was Romeo and Juliet through and through, you know. <laughs> right. But so in her Vogue article, which was celebrating the 25 year anniversary of the film uh she talked to vogue about why she thinks this film has resonated over so many years she said i think the reason it endures in fashion is that a lot of people who are now heading up these fashion houses were in that age group 25 years ago it was a new way of viewing shakespeare and i think whether consciously or subconsciously it impacted people of that generation especially the music, which was extremely evocative and emotional and carried the story. I think everything came together to serve the characters and made them memorable. Even if the storytelling was heightened, the character the characters were king. I always say to people that a costume isn't anything without a person in it. It becomes something when the actor puts it on and becomes the character. And I think that's why it resonates with people. It's a testament to the enduring power of Shakespeare and his characters and our ability to reinterpret them for our time. It was a film about two teenagers that was really made for that age group. And I'm still proud of it. I've done lots of films by now and I still think it's my favorite. Oh, that's cool. I love that quote. I mean, yeah, I totally understand. Um, Everyone I've talked to who, you know, kind of grew up with this movie, they love this movie. Yeah. Um, so it is a classic, it is a costume design um, masterpiece. I can't believe it wasn't nominated for Academy Award because um, it really, to me, stands the test of time. It's incredible costuming and Kim Barrett is one of the goats. She is. Absolutely. <laughs> she is. A, she's your go to. She knows. Right. She knows. Kim, we want to talk to you about The Matrix. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Spencer, are you ready to play our favorite game? Let's do it. Daniel, hit the track. The one costume to rule them all. Spencer, what was your one costume to rule them all? I think mine was pretty simple. I liked Romeo's night armor. It's just like an armor I've kind of grown up knowing about but never having seen the movie so now that i've seen it i just think it's pretty cool actually i'm having second thoughts as we talk about this elizabeth oh no what <laughs> i'm actually switching to juliet's dress because now i'm remembering the lines that were printed onto it and i just think it's stunning beautiful honestly but really those two ball looks were my favorite costumes that could just be a twofer Right. Because it's, it's a cohesive look that's meant to go together. They support each other. They support each other. And I only say that because my one costume to rule them all is also a twofer. <laughs> we cheated this week. We did. It is their <laughs> final looks in the in the chapel. Her hey, beat. they are cohesive. They are cohesive. Her long, beautiful white dress, his blue Hawaiian shirt ensemble. It does make them look young and it's tragic and it's everything this story is about <laughs> and it still explains like the you know the ideation between both of their houses when you look yeah. at them laying next to each other so yeah. masterpiece yeah. it was so good absolutely <laughs> with that elizabeth 
I think we picked some good costumes, but if you all disagree with us, or if you do agree with us, feel free to leave us a voicemail at 626-515-1826, or you can send us an email at the Art of Costume Blogcast at gmail.com and let us know what your one costume to rule them all was. And with that, Elizabeth, we are at the end of our Shakespeare month. Uh, we are, Spencer, but what 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 world are we going to creep into next? So we're still kind of staying close to where we were. You know, we've had a lot of fun talking about the work of Baz Luhrmann and Catherine Martin. So our next month of episodes is going to be our first Catherine Martin month. Yes. So we're going to be talking about The Great Gatsby next week with a special guest host. So it's going to be pretty awesome. I am so excited. Uh, in the meantime, if you want some content from us you can follow us at the art of costume pod on instagram at the art of costume on tiktok uh you can also get some merch from the art of costume.com slash pod store and if you really liked what you listened and you you love us you <laughs> could leave us a little five star text review on apple podcast or a five star review on spotify we would really appreciate that everybody We'll see you in two weeks. A curse upon both of the houses. No, nothing but blessings upon everybody's houses. Oh, right, right, right. Have a good day, everyone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>The Art of Costume Blogcast is hosted and produced by Elizabeth Joy Glass and Spencer Williams. Our audio engineering and editing is done by Dan White. Follow us on Instagram at The Art of Costume Pod or visit theartofcostumeblogcast.com for all blogcast updates. If you want to support the show, go to theartofcostume.com slash podstore. For more costume reviews, deep dives, and interviews, head over to theartofcostume.com, a blog dedicated to highlighting the best in costume design. Thank you.